Evening, folk. Nice to see you out tonight. And um, thanks for coming out to join us in worship this evening. We're going to sing. Um, I love this hymn. I hope we've got the right tune. Um, sometimes, yeah, all hail the power of Jesus' name. And if, if, if this isn't the right tune, then I'm going to cry. And, um, and um, we'll, we'll see, because the words are great and the tune's great as well. And after speaking on, on the devil shouldn't have all the good music last week, um, I hope we've nailed it this week. So let's have a go. And um, let's stand if we're able and let's sing together. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, tonight as we bow in your holy presence, we thank you that your son is crowned with all majesty and all power and all dominion and all authority. It's not waiting for a day that we will crown him, as it were. He already is king of kings and lord of lords. 
But Lord, we thank you for that eternal hope that is ours, that one day we will join that multitude of heaven and give praise to the one who alone is worthy. Lord, to think that by your grace and because of your mercy and in your lavish love that we might have the privilege of being there around your throne to see you face to face to spend eternity in the presence of of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, we're familiar with these truths, but may we start to fully comprehend the wonder of what awaits the people of God. Fallen, sinful, debased sinners in the presence of holiness itself accepted because we have been redeemed. And no wonder we're going to spend eternity singing your praises. Because though that reality, that truth is just, time will never be long enough and could never be long enough to express the gratitude that will fill our hearts when we realize in full all that Christ has done for us. But on this side of eternity, would you draw back the curtain? Would you lift the veil? And would you give us here a comprehension of the wonder of Christ? And we bless you that, we thank you that we're coming to a significant week in, 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 in the church calendar as it were. But, but Lord, we want to th- say we're sorry that that we just emphasize the, the resurrection and the cross for a week and then we're, we, we move on to something else. Lord, if it wasn't for the cross, if it wasn't for the empty tomb, then we would have no hope any time of the year. And Lord, it's because of the resurrection, because of the death of Christ, that we are redeemed, that we are accepted, that we are yours tonight. And Lord, help us to proclaim that with the excitement that the team had this morning of rolling down the aisles telling folk, he's risen. Lord, may that be the reality of our hearts this week to tell folk that Christ indeed is risen. And for them to understand what that really means for them here and now. Lord, as we come as a people, we come as a needy people. Lord, you know the needs within the fellowship. You know the needs within our homes. You know the needs within our hearts. Lord, you know the brokenness and you know the hurt and you know the pain. And you've seen the scars. And you understand the wounds and you have collected every tear. And Lord, we thank you there is not a situation that we cannot bring and more importantly, leave with you. And tonight we do that in the quietness of our hearts. There are families. There are homes. There are individuals that need you. And Lord, we've got loved ones tonight who know not you. And their desperate need is that their eyes might be opened and their hearts might be softened. Lift the scales away, we pray. Help them to see the beauty and wonder and the majesty of Christ. Some of them haven't darkened a church door in years. Some of them have never darkened a church door. 
But Lord, you can still meet them. You can still change them. Lord, you can still save them. But Lord, we would ask that in these days, souls will be saved. Lives will be changed. Homes will be transformed. Lord, that's why you've left us here. To go and make disciples. Help us to do that, we pray. So Lord, help us this evening as we've come to worship. Captivate our hearts and our minds afresh. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's sing again. Um, King of kings, majesty, Lord of heaven living in me. Let's stand if we're able. Can I just draw your attention to one or two notices? Tuesday night is prayer meeting here. Love to see you at the prayer meeting. If you can't make it in person, then please join us on Zoom. I repeat this. I've repeated it so often because it is the truth. It is the most important meeting in the church calendar period. And it's important as God's people, we meet together and pray together. Um, so Holy Week, love to see you on Tuesday night, half past seven. Wednesday's toddlers. Um, Thursday um, is our Monday, Thursday communion here at half past seven. Um, please keep that in mind and come and we'll be coming around the Lord's table and sharing around God's word. Then Friday is our kids club, our Easter explained um, for all of our children and um, their families and our toddlers and their families as well. And um, so pray for that as we simply explain the, Christ, the, the Christmas story, the Easter story um, with them on Friday night. Then Saturday morning, we have a church breakfast at nine. If you haven't signed up, then please do so. I think there's about 50 signed up so far, which will be great. 
and um, a bit of sausage and bacon, and, and um, Chris is even making porridge. I don't know why. And um, but there you go. So you can come, and there'll be there'll be something for all tastes um, on on Saturday morning, and we'll begin sharing God's word. And then Sunday morning and evening, um, we're going to look at the simple subject of why does what difference does Easter make, and um, looking at God's word um, next Sunday. Just to say Monday week, um, I will be off for the week, and um, so from Monday the 1st through to the 7th, I will be on leave, and um, so please talk to one of the leadership if you need. As we mentioned this morning, um, Tom Barlow went home to be with the Lord this week, and his funeral would take place on Monday the 8th of April here at 1 o'clock. Um, tournament will have taken place privately for the family um, earlier, um, but It'll be here for service of thanksgiving for Tom at one o'clock on Monday the 8th. I think that's about, oh yeah, it's Alan's gift day today. I forgot about that. Um, so there are little envelopes at the door. Um, we're continuing to support Alan in not just prayer, but in a very practical way. Um, some will have asked and, and still are, well, is it... Um, is that it would actually cost him more to go to Bible college in London than it is to go into Bible college in Australia. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? And um, um, fees and living expenses. And he gets the sun out there as well. And um, he'll come back. No, he only knows what color he'll come back. Um, we won't talk to him when he does, when he comes back as brown as anything, will we? But um, we want to support him and, and help him. And so there's a gift day. There's envelopes available. Or, and so mark those envelopes with Alan's name or you can do it through your bank transfer through the, through the church bank account. And again, just mark that with Alan's name. And that won't just be for today. We'll leave that open for a little while um, so that we can continue to support him and pray for him. Actually, let's stop and do that just for a moment. Let me pray. Father, I do want to take time to pray for Alan tonight. Thank you for him. Thank you for your call on his life um, to ministry. And we thank you for the way he settled um, in Australia, we thank you for the church at St. Jude's that have been so good to him. And Lord, as he continues to make friends amongst the other students, and as he continues to come to terms with the amount of study and work that is um, being loaded on him, we pray that we thank you that your grace, your will never leads us where your grace can't keep us. So Lord, we ask for grace upon grace in his life. Um, may it be more than just good theology that he's absorbing. Lord, may that truth then transform his life um, into the person of Christ. Um, not he might come back a better teacher or a better communicator, but he might go on to serve you as a man of God. Uh, and Lord, for all of his needs, we thank you that you own the cattle on a thousand hills and you never see one of your servants destitute. So Lord, we pray that you will help us, not just to give, but to pray and to support. And, and Lord, that he will be mightily used in the days that lie ahead. Guard him and keep him, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles, please. 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, and we're going to, it is the story of David and Goliath, but we're going to break this up. Um, if you want a title for tonight, um, it's simply going to be Details Matter. It's a story we're very familiar with, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper, and um, that's why I'm only dealing with the first 11 verses tonight, because details, and the details we get in these first 11 verses, matter to the whole story and our understanding of the whole story. And um, so let's read the first 11 verses. And um, I will read verse one, and I'm regretting that immediately. And um, I've, I've, I have, I've been practicing this all week in my head, not to read it, but to preach this. And I'm kind of going, Lord. And um, I remember at, in Bible college, um, he's come to my mind, an old lecture of ours called Robin Mosscrop. Robin was from Northumbria, he's still alive. 
Um, Robin was from the Thumbria and with a real deep Northumbrian accent. And he says, listen, when you come to names in the Bible, just say them with courage. No one else knows how they're pronounced. The only person who knows how they're pronounced is in glory and they'll be waiting for you. But that's a whole different theology, especially when you get someone's name wrong. These are just places, so I don't feel it. So you just have to, that's how you, that's how you come to these names. Because then the rest of the congregation go, oh, that's how you pronounce it. I've been wrong all these years. Um, but in my case, you don't believe that, do you? <laughs> so I'll read verse one, someone read verse two, and we'll read the whole way down to verse 11. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled Asuka in Judah. They pitched the camp in Ephes, Danim, between Soka and Ahaz. That'll do. stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. and terrified. We're going to look at some of those details in just a moment. We're going to sing before we do. A breath of life comes sweeping through us. Um, let's stand if we're able and let's sing.
great. That's, I can guarantee if you read that hymn every day to yourself and out loud, and you did it for a month, you wouldn't be the same again. Not if you meant it. Let's just bow in a moment's prayer before we look at God's word tonight, can't we? Lord, would you equip us this evening to preach your word, to hear your word? Would you breathe on your word tonight so that it might captivate our hearts and change us into the men and women we ought to be? Speak, O Lord, we ask. For Christ's glory, we ask it. Amen. I wonder how would you describe yourself in this two ways? Would you describe yourself as a pessimist or as an optimist? Has every cloud got a silver lining or does every silver lining have a cloud? Hmm. And for those who are optimists, the negativity of a pessimist is a little trying, isn't it? They just get on your nerves sometimes. But the, the opposite side of that coin is, if you're a pessimist, the optimists are frustratingly unrealistic. So you're, you're, you annoy each other to the same degree. <laughs> but I wonder what kind of person you are, an optimist or a pessimist. And you might say, well, it depends on the circumstances. I fluctuate. I'm not quite sure if that's true or not. I think we, we tend to be one or the other more than we often, than, than the other. In this chapter, in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, the challenges that the people of Israel face show us those who are optimists and show us those who are pessimists. Some saw a wonderful opportunity and others saw impending disaster. And the story of David and Goliath, I can guarantee we all, right, who learned this as a child? Shove your hand up. Some of you didn't. But who knows the story of David and Goliath really well? Virtually all of us do. John Woodhouse puts it this way. It is all the ingredients of drama and excitement, anticipation and the satisfaction that the good guy defeats the bad guy against all the odds. The story is so skillfully told that it holds our attention. It captures our imagination, no matter how familiar we become with it. And he's right. It is one of those great stories. If, if children know nothing and you want to tell them an exciting Bible story, you take them to this. Well, in Samuel 17, you tell them the story of David and Goliath. But the context of this story should never be lost. See, it comes at a difficult moment in Israel's history. If you've been with me through this whole study so far, Saul has been appointed the nation's first king. He was to bring stability. He was to bring security, especially at times like this. It was for a time like this that Saul was called to stand up and be counted. But sadly, due to his disobedience to God, it meant that God had rejected him. And more importantly, as we discovered last week, God had removed his Holy Spirit from him. Secretly, God has appointed and chosen a new king. And on him, David, the Spirit of God dwells. Now, when we were at this, I said um, weeks ago, months ago now, when we were in chapter 8, the key verse to 1 Samuel is chapter 8 and verse 20, because on, on that verse, everything changed. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. We want a king. We just want to be like all the other nations. And this is what he's going to do. He's going to lead us. He's going to fight our battles for us. Sadly, up until chapter 8 and after chapter 8. Israel had forgotten how the Lord had delivered them. How the Lord had delivered them from worse situations in chapter 17. And he delivered them more than once. 
take time to read the chapter. We are going to dig through this over the next number of weeks. We're going to have a couple of weeks break because Easter next week and then I'm missing and then we'll come back to it. But, but this is a, in this whole chapter, there's something, it's, it's, it's what's missing is, is as vital as what's there. And what's missing is no one cries to God. No one seeks God's counsel, bar one. The teenager on whom the Spirit of God dwells. The one who God has equipped for the task ahead. You see, Israel's constant miscalculation is this. They either forget or deliberately forsake God. And can I suggest that's the the, the, the tragic miscalculation that we all make constantly. We either forget or we forsake God. And they did it again and again and again when they needed him the most. And as I said tonight, if you, the, the title we're going to have for this sermon tonight is, is Details Matter, because I want us to appreciate the details in this story so it helps us understand, for, for many of us, just a familiar Sunday school story, but I hope it, it drives home some important and vital truths to our hearts. Three very simple little things we're going to notice tonight. I want us to, first of all, notice the men on the sidelines, because we're told who they are. Verse 1, now the Philistines gathered their forces for war. We've already seen the Philistines. Like the Israelites, they're newcomers to what's known as the promised land. They've settled mainly on the coast of Israel. And they moved in again, roughly at the same time that Israel moved in. And they have five main cities, Ekron, Ashdod, Gath, Askelon, and Gaza. Again, when we looked at this a few months ago, so relevant because those names keep coming up today in our news on a daily basis. And each of these five cities had their own. Now, you have to give them the title king with a little k because they all worked together. Low, he, he, they were kind of federal princes is the best way. They, 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 they were, they were, each city worked independently, but they worked as a grouping together. And so they had a lord, a king that ruled over them. But the five of them worked in conjunction one with the other. And this wasn't the first time they had their forces came to war. Actually, the Philistine threat has been the background to the whole 16 chapters that have gone before. The Philistine threat are go is going to last the whole way through one and two Samuel. Actually, Saul will die in conflict with the Philistines. But it's back in chapter 4 that Israel suffered two defeats simultaneously at the hand of the Philistines. And because of those two defeats, the Ark of the Covenant is captured. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are killed. And well, everything's in a mess. And then you skip on to chapter 7. And after that whole mess of chapter 4 and 5 and 6, God delivers Israel from the Philistines. And he delivers them for this simple reason. Verse 4 of chapter 7. So the Israelites put away the Baals and Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. Through Samuel, because of Samuel's teaching, because of Samuel's ministry, because of the, the anointing on, on, on the prophet of God, they came to their senses. God opened their eyes. They understood, listen, the reason we keep getting defeated, the reason we are defeated, people, is because we have allowed other gods to take the place of the one true God. By the way, do you need me to draw the parallels? 
We will always face defeat and we will always face disaster when we allow someone else to sit on the throne that belongs to the Lord and to the Lord himself. There can never be victory otherwise. But even with the dramatic rescue of chapter 7, it's only a very short time till you get to chapter 8. And they go, we want a king. We don't want Samuel to be the prophet. We don't want God to be the leader. We want a king. We just want to be like all the other nations. They went back to forgetting and forsaking. Doesn't take long. And more battles occur. Chapter 9, chapter 13, chapter 14. There's one thing you could say about these Philistines. They love to fight. I mean, heaven help if they ever got drunk. Could you imagine? I mean, these fellas didn't need to be. They, they just loved a fight. <laughs> no, I was going to say something, but I will be very kind. And um, <laughs> so that's why the Irish are often called the Philistines. <laughs> I'm allowed to get away with that. That's not racist. <laughs> but, that's, but you can understand. They just, oh, come on. Let's, 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 let's. And they loved to fight with Israel. And we're given, we're given some very specific detail here in verse 1. They assembled. And we're told where? Soka, Ephes, and Danim. I should have got a, a, a big map out, and I, I was, it was my plan, and I forgot all about it. Get an get a atlas out of Bible times. And find those spots on your Bible atlas. And, and here's the reason why. This is the furthest west this lot have ever come. They've never, they've, they've never dared step over the Rubicon as it was. This is, this is new territory. This belongs to the Judah. And the reason they're there is back to chapter 14. It's when Saul is called a fool by Samuel. See, the king wasn't doing a very good job and everyone knew about it. And the Philistines saw a weakness and with a weakness, they saw an opportunity. It wouldn't have been long before the Philistines would have heard what the prophet of God said in front of all of Israel about the king on the throne. You're a fool. And the Philistines would have looked at each other. These five kings would have got together and goes, Israel has never been weaker. Saul has never been weaker. Boys, here's our opportunity. And it says, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up the battle lines to meet the Philistines. When I mentioned um, Robin Moskrop earlier, he taught us Hebrew in college and um, I remember sitting there going I will never use this ever and um, I need to probably write to him and apologize because I remember him teaching us this this was 30 years ago and um, but it's important and the reason it's important is this the word assembled in verse 1 and the word assembled in verse 2 are in two very different Hebrew tenses I don't want to lose you the first one is in the active tense The second one is in the passive tense. So when it says the Philistines assembled, their five leaders got together and goes, right boys, weakness, opportunity, come on. And they all went, yep, up for a fight. Let's do this. Come on, let's go to the camp. Let's take territory we've never, let's cross that line that we've never crossed before. Come on, we're up for this. We can do this. You can sense that sense of, that that active tension, Tense that's given here. They assembled. But when it says that Saul and the Israelites assembled, it's in the passive tense. In other words, the Philistines have camped. They're all going, come on. And the Israelites go, well, I suppose we're better. Come on. And when it says Saul and the Israelites 
There's no indication here that Saul led the Israelites there. He just tagged along. He's the king after all. He was the one, remember, we, he's going to lead us in battle. He's the one who's going to fight our battles for us. But he just, the, the tense is, he just tagged along and, and they set up. You, you, you get the picture. They were defeated before they even arrived. How can we win this? Before Goliath ever showed up and before they ever realized this fellow existed, that when they, when they assembled, one came with a positive, come on, let's do this. And Israel goes, oh, are we better? Because they're asking for a fight and, and we have to, or they're just going to take over the territory and, and ride roughshore over everyone. And the Israelites and the Philistines occupied the hill and the, Is and the Israelites the other and the valley in between. You have to go back to chapter 13 and chapter 14. The similarities to this are striking. The, the, the contours of, of where they are, two massive ravines and, and, and this valley in between. And Saul's heart isn't in it. They look across the valley and they go, why bother? And this was before the big man appeared. <laughs> and by the way, the landscape would have made Goliath look even bigger. They picked the right spot. Even if I stood in the middle of that valley, I would look quite substantial. That's saying something. That's the men on the sidelines. That's the context of where we are. Israelites, the Philistines. Can you understand why the clouds were gathering and folk were finding it hard to see the silver lining at all? Then you have the man in the middle. <laughs> Verse four. A champion. The word champion literally means the man of the between. There's no irony here, but that's exactly, he stood between in the valley and he looked. This Philistine embodied, was the embodiment of a sing, the Philistine threat was an embodiment of a sing, in a single individual. And his name, like his appearance, would have sounded menacing. Do you realize He's only named twice in the whole chapter. Hmm. But once heard, never forgotten. It's kind of one of those names that just comes with it, the sense of awe and menacing. And his, his name isn't just of, of importance. Where he's from is of vital importance. He's from Gath. Go back to chapter 5. When the Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant in chapter 4, and then God brought plagues and, and, and death on the Philistines, they, they all goes right. Who wants it? <laughs> we looked at it, it became a hot potato. The five kings met together, and they all goes, your turn. And they point to the king of Gath, and he took it. And there was death and there was destruction and there was panic when the Ark of the Covenant arrived in Gath. And then when you get to chapter 7, where God restores Israel, where God helps Israel in a remarkable way defeat the Philistines, the towns of Ekron and Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel. And Israel delivered to the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. By bringing Goliath from Gath, the Philistines are making a point. We held this and then you took it back, but it's ours now. 
I can't remember the movie it's from, but there's one of those great scenes in, in, in movie history where it goes, I'm back. <laughs> That's here. That's the Philistines. They're going, Gath, in chapter seven, God may have delivered it into your hands, but it's our territory now. And let us introduce you to the fellow we're bringing from our hometown. If this was redone as a boxing match, <laughs> you can imagine one of those promoters standing in the middle of the ring with a microphone coming down, ladies and gentlemen, in the red corner from the town that once belonged to the blue corner comes. Can you understand why detail is so important? There's no silver lining here. Israel's heart is sunk. They've all become pessimists. And we haven't got Goliath's appearance yet. Then Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistines' ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. A couple of chapters back, God has said, don't look at the outward appearance. Actually, frankly, you can't miss this fellow's outward appearance. I am going to do this. I haven't given him any notice. James, come here a minute. I just want to drive this point home. <laughs> I'm going to use this as a very physical illustration. Okay, I'm five foot six and a quarter. That quarter is very important. Never underestimate a man of a quarter. All right, and you're six foot, five. six foot five. You're just a foot bigger than me. But look at us. I mean, no. Uh, thank you very much. You just look, and, and that's it. Well, hold on. They're, just, uh, they're, mocking, they're not mocking you. They're mocking me. Now, hold on. He makes me look titchy. Goliath, he's only one foot bigger than me. Goliath's three foot bigger than him. I mean, this fella, not you. The other one is Mahusuf. And you're, right, that'll do. Go on. And um, thank you for that. But you get the picture. I mean, he's just huge. I mean, James is standing there going, really? <laughs> I mean, I can, I can headbutt James's chin. Well, I can kind of armpits. But the other way around, James headbutts Goliath's belly button. Come on, he's just huge. And, and then, listen, he wore a bronze helmet and a bronze coat, mailed weight, 125 pounds, an old money that's eight stone nine. When I came here, I was lighter than that. I have increased a little. Um, it's called old age. And, um, but that's just me. That's him carrying me around on his chest. That's context. He wore bronze leg armor. He carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of a spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. It's as thick as that pulpit. He just carried it around. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying his shield. Do you notice? It took... They wouldn't have asked me to carry his shield because I wouldn't have been able to. It took a James to carry this fellow's shield. You can understand the sense of dismay, can't you? And why such detail about his armor and what it was made of? You have to go back to chapter 13 to understand the significance. Chapter 13 and verse 19. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole of the land of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, matlocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for the sharpening of a plow point and matlocks, third of a shekel for the sharpening of forks and axes 
and the repointing of goats. The Philistines had a monopoly on metalwork. The fact that he was covered, he was not the original iron man, he was the original bronze man. And the reason he's covered head to toe was of huge significance. We are, in just putting Goliath out in the middle of that valley, we are technologically superior to you in every way. It's, in today's, it's me going out with a BB gun and somebody walking out and going, I've got a Gatlin gun. Hi, how do you think who's going to win? We, we, we just beat you technologically, hands down. We're superior to you in every way. The way he looked was meant to impress. He stood as one indestructible fortress. How do you get through or anywhere near a fellow like that? He was a menacing sight. By the way, we'll come back to it. In all of that detail, there was one flaw. His helmet didn't cover his face. His helmet didn't cover his face. They were so arrogant. They thought they were so technically superior. He'll never get close enough. The men on the sidelines, the Philistines and the Israelites. The man in the middle, Goliath. And the man and his threats. It says, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. You're mesmerized by what you see. But now you're terrified by the thunder of what you hear. In the context, you can go to that valley today and um, the acoustics are phenomenal. You don't need hearing aids. You don't need um, a loop system. It works. If you go to plant a church, plant it smack in the middle of the valley and, and, and put the seat in the ground, you could be heard. And this big fella steps out and he thunders threats. It was meant to make your blood run cold and boy, it would have. Why do you not come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? He's mocking the directionlessness of Israel. Everybody knows, knew Saul didn't want to be there. Everybody knew Saul was leading them nowhere. He's emphasizing who they are. And he's making them out to be nothing but more than slaves of Saul. Listen, do you not realize how pathetic you are that you're following him? This is psychological warfare long before it was ever described as that. This is defeating an enemy ever before a shot was fired. <laughs> this is leaflet dropping from an airplane and going, give up, you've lost. And then he uses these words, choose a man and have him come down to me. Listen, even the Philistines didn't want a bloodbath. But those words, choose a man and have him come down to me, echoed with the listeners. Israel, go back to chapter eight. Israel had chosen a man and Saul with his name. Whether Goliath realizes the significance of his words, we don't know. But boy, those words would have struck home. We want a king. We are asking for a king. And Saul means asked for. And they got what they asked for. Now choose a man. Will you have chosen? There he's there. And by the way, how do we describe Saul? 
chapter 10 and verse 23, they ran, they ran and brought him out and he stood among his people and he was a head taller than anyone else. Listen, he's the biggest fellow you've got. But he's still just James's size. <laughs> Compared to Goliath, no chance. But he's the only candidate. It should have been the king, shouldn't it? Verse nine, if he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you'll become our subjects and serve us. By the way, the story as we'll pan out would prove that Goliath was a liar. But the Philistines wouldn't submit to the Israelites when they won. You could imagine he paused and let silence descend on the valley to let those words sink in. As everybody presently is looking around for Saul. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. The word defy means scorn. I mock you. I am in utter contempt of all of you and of him. But that phrase of the armies of Israel. You see, even the enemies of God knew that the captain of the hosts of the armies of heaven and the armies of Israel was the God of heaven. Goliath said, I'm, I've got contempt, I'm mocking, I'm defying God. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing this, the Philistines' words, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified, only a fool would pretend things weren't desperate. Context, detail of vital importance. There's not one optimist, there's not one glimmer of a silver lining anywhere to be seen in the first 11 verses. The picture couldn't be painted any darker. The heart has gone out of the king, the heart has now just been sucked out of all of Israel. Go back to chapter nine, verse 16. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him to be ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people for their cry has reached me. This is what Saul was meant to do. Under God. But God's hand has been withdrawn. God's spirit has been withdrawn from Saul for simple and deliberate and habitual disobedience. The details leave us with a blank, bleak outlook, don't they? But what's the phrase? It's always darkest before the dawn. You see, if we didn't know the rest of the story, you'd go, well, where's the sovereignty of God in this? Where's the grace of God in this? Where's the power of God in this? God has made the provision. God has equipped a man for the task. Max Licardo, who's an American author and pastor and writer, wrote a book a while ago called Facing Our Giants. And it's in the life of David. And if you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's brilliant, really good, very devotional, very practical, good theology. And chapter after chapter, he describes the Goliaths that we face in our lives. 
those unsurmountable fortresses of destruction (laughs) that just overwhelm us. It's that habit that I can't break. It's that relationship I can't do without. It's that thing I just keep going back to again and again. It's that fear, it's that dismay. How many times have those Goliaths slayed us? How many times has this story turned out the other way around in our lives? What did I say at the beginning? The tragedy of what's not written here is as much as what is written here. The tragedy is this. The reason, folk, we face our Goliaths and we are defeated by them is because one, we have forgot or two, we have forsaken the counsel of God. And whatever giant that you face in your life, that temptation, that burden, that brokenness, that that habit, it will never be defeated. If you step out on your own, I don't need to ruin the story. But read the rest of the chapter. In whose strength does David go? In the Lord's. Under whose direction does David go? The Lord's. Under whose equipping does David win? The Lord's. Let me finish with this promise. Not mine, his. Isaiah 59, verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from west (laughs) and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, what will happen? The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The redeemer will come to Zion to those who turn from transgression In Jacob, says the Lord. When the enemy comes in, when we face our Goliaths and we're overwhelmed, and we've got to deal with this in a couple of weeks' time, when we're overwhelmed by the giant that, and there's no cloud, there's there's no silver lining, and all the optimism, optimism has been sucked out of the air. When the spirit, when the enemy comes in like the flood, it's then the Lord will lift a standard against him. Remember John Woodhouse's words at the beginning? It's the anticipation and the satisfaction that the good guy defeating the bad guy against all the odds. It's the satisfaction that knows that God then took the field stepped onto the valley and the giant was felled. You know the details in your life that is causing you defeat. That's why details matter. So what are you going to do with them? Forget and forsake? Or let the Lord do for you what he did for David. Equip and surrender to the captain of the hosts of the armies of Israel who brought them victory. 
Let me pray. Father, you understand our needs better than we do. And you know the battles that each of us face and are fighting even tonight. And some of our Goliaths are massive. And many of them are of our own making simply because of our disobedience to you. But Lord, you're still in the business of restoring. You're still in the business of equipping. You're still in the business of bringing victory and changing the whole scenario completely on its head when we surrender to your will and to your way. Now, Lord, give us the grace tonight to do that and help us to see our Goliaths fall. And may it be for the glory of Christ alone. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. We're going to sing the splendor of the king. There is one king who takes the field of battle for us today. And his name is Jesus. Let's stand and let's sing this in closing together.
Father, would you take your truth and your word and would you write it on our hearts that we might not sin against thee. Lord, help us to live for you this week. Help us to shine forth the glory of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Use us, we pray. Use us, we pray, to lead someone to Jesus. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide on each and every one of us until you come or until you call, and then forevermore in the people of God's said, Amen.